Over the years, many people have picked up new lifestyles, which they may call zero waste, minimalist, eco-conscious, or many other things. While everyone has their own reasons for changing their lifestyle, there is a growing number who are doing it because they want to help fight climate change. The unfortunate truth, however, is that they're having a much smaller impact than they might think. Why? Well, this study by CDP shows that 100 producers account for 71% of global industrial greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. So, we run around living our little zero-waste lives, and these companies, they just continue killing the planet. Hi, I'm Nathan, someone who likes reading scientific reports. And this is Save Money, Save the Planet. Alright, fine, I'll admit it. I'm one of those zero-waste people. So, why do I continue doing it? Why wash my clothes on cold, hang dry my laundry, and have meatless Mondays if I know that it's pointless? Well, the way that I see it, the point is to keep the problem front and center for myself so that I'm ready to act when the time comes. When I eat my overnight oats in the morning instead of bacon, it's actually like I'm in the gym lifting weights before a boxing match. I gotta get in shape, because the fight? Eh, it's gonna be a hard one. In fact, let's talk about what that fight looks like. The fight, quite simply, is forcing these 100 companies to restrict their carbon emissions. Boom, done, problem solved, and you're welcome. Wait, what? That sounds a lot like regulation. And regulation isn't actually that easy? Alright, alright, fine. You're right. This is kind of a David and Goliath situation, if we're being honest. And unfortunately, Goliath typically wins. So, before we get farther, let me give you a mini history lesson, which I hope you'll find encouraging. 20 years ago, the town of West Monroe was running out of water. The interesting twist here, though, is that West Monroe isn't in a drought state like California, Nevada, or Texas. No, they're in Louisiana. The issue was that the paper mill was using up all of their water, but, of course, it would be political to tell them to use less, since the paper mill was also the largest employer in the town. Eventually, local government dedicated funds to upgrading their sewage plant in order to provide recycled water for the paper mill, then, they mandated that they only use recycled water. That way, all natural water was saved for citizens, and that solved the problem. Regulation actually worked. Do you find that inspiring? Well, then be sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss my next video. But let's get back into it. The reason why we have to go forward on this path is because you can't really blame your neighbor for not being zero waste. Why in the world would they take the bus to work instead of driving if the bus costs twice as much and takes three times as long? Why should they pay to re-insulate their house when they can use natural gas to heat it instead and it'll barely cost them much money at all? Regulatory intervention is absolutely needed if we want to make any real progress. One common argument against government intervention is that it will be inequitable and will affect poorer people more than the rest of us. After all, if we tax an oil company whenever they create a barrel of oil, then they might just charge their customer more for said barrel. This price increase will continue all the way down the supply chain until it gets to the gas pump and we, the citizens, end up paying more per gallon of gas. But some groups like Citizens Climate Lobby have actually thought of a solution to that. These guys want to implement a carbon tax at the source and then pay all funds from that tax out equally to all citizens. This means that peasants like you and me who just use an average to below average amount of gas will end up getting paid more money than we pay. Meanwhile, people who are flying multiple times a week, and yeah, they exist, they'll end up paying far more in taxes than they receive back. Over time, the increased costs will create room for lower carbon technologies to flourish because they won't be at such a price disadvantage. Now, sitting around watching a YouTube video which badmouths giant corporations it feels good, but it's not going to change the world anytime soon. So, let's talk about what you can go do today with this knowledge. The most impactful thing that you can do is use less gasoline. 
Even if you continue to drive the same exact car, there are ways to increase your miles per gallon. I've linked the full article by Investopedia.com below, but my favorite tips are, number one, to reduce the amount of heavy acceleration and deceleration that you do, because this wastes gasoline on unused power. Number two, decrease the speed that you drive on the freeway, because even just going five miles per hour slower can increase your fuel efficiency by 7% or more. Number three, ensure that your tires are always properly inflated so that you don't have unneeded road resistance. And finally, number four, don't idle your car while taking a lunch break or waiting for someone, because that way, you don't waste gasoline on, well, not moving. If a person who typically drives 250 miles per week were to do all four of these things, they could actually end up saving eight whole bucks per week. Yeah, all right, all right. That may not sound like a lot, but it's how much I spent on these groceries here. So it's also not nothing. Oh, and let's not forget about just plain using your car less. I met a lady just the other week. She told me that she only puts gas in her car once every five weeks because she simply walks almost everywhere. Now, of course, she was retired and the rest of us fall into the ain't nobody got time for that category, but I still found it inspiring. Simply choosing to walk, ride a bike, or carpool occasionally when you're headed somewhere keeps more money in your pocket and away from those 100 companies. Now, you might be thinking, hey, Jason, I see coal in this report, and I don't use any coal. Well, first of all, my name's Nathan, get it right. But secondly, coal is used globally as one of the main ways of generating electricity. So, any amount that you reduce your electricity usage will again keep money in your pocket and away from those companies, while also triggering less coal burning and therefore keeping greenhouse gas emissions down. Hey, three birds with one stone. That is almost how many birds a coal plant kills per gigawatt hour. Here's some of my favorite things that I've done lately for electricity. Use cold water when you do your laundry. Hang dry some of your laundry. Try not to use the AC or heat or at least change the temperature on the thermostat so that it's less extreme. And move electricity usage to non-peak hours, like by using the delay function on your dishwasher. And if you happen to own your own home, and you have some money to invest, then you could look into getting solar panels or redoing your insulation as well. Finally, the report by CDP also mentioned that 32% of these 100 companies are actually owned by public investors. So, if you have a 401k, you can look to move your funds to an ESG index fund, which will ensure that your money is not invested in fossil fuels, while still being low enough risk that you should build up a nice little nest egg. BlackRock is also an investing company who is working to reduce the fossil fuels in their index funds. They're not a perfect option by any means, but they are better than nothing. And then lastly, the report mentioned that 59% of the companies were state-owned. So it is absolutely imperative that you vote for renewable energies, carbon taxes, and just the whole shebang, any chance that you get. So what about you? Do you have a favorite way to combat these 100 companies? Then leave it in a comment below so we can all try it out. All right, that's all I got for now. Now go make a difference today.